you don't have that security. There is no security in religion. I don't care whether it's Baptist, Episcopalian, or whatever it might be, whatever tag you put on it, it provides no security. That's why when you ask folks of all the various religions, are you going to heaven when you die, the most normal response is, I hope so. Well, if all your religion provides for you is an, an I hope so, I would quit. I would date it yesterday. I would tell all of my friends and family I'm through with that junk. I want something that will give me some security. Amen. So, good song, good song. Amen. Uh, several places tonight. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, really more perhaps, I don't know how it will end up, but it will start out as a Bible study and try to move through it quickly and uh, there's just no predicting what may happen, but uh, uh, this is a communion service, and uh, uh, when we have a communion service, it is, to me, I think, vital that we comprehend some things about what we are doing. Uh, the passage before us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 deals with the carnal Corinthians, and they had their problems, but uh, the Lord loved them. He wrote more to them than he did anybody else. As far as verses and words, the Corinthians received the greater part of the attention. And uh, so God cared about them. He loved them. And we ought to love them because we're probably more like them than we would care to admit. But uh, he was trying to bring them from immaturity to maturity, from uh, a level that they had known since they became a Christian to a level that they should have been striving to achieve in their walk with the Lord. And in that context of trying to help them grow, we find 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And that's what we will use tonight in our communion service. I'll be reading from verse 23 as we uh, pass out the uh, things tonight and observe communion. And, and at that point you'll recognize them. But I want to read just a verse here and then comment for a few minutes tonight on uh, uh, what communion from the Scripture really is about. And uh, he says here in verse number 26, For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Uh, it's indicative of the seriousness of what they were doing when they observed communion. It certainly, if anything, was a, a, a solemn occasion, a time of remembrance, a time of looking back specifically to uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was serious enough that in this same passage, the Apostle Paul speaks to a church that had been abusive of what communion was really all about. They had uh, gone beyond the parameters that God had given to govern the observance of uh, the Lord's Supper. And as a result of that, he says to them, For this cause many among you are sickly and some sleep. And the idea of sleep there is not just taking it easy and crashing in the hammock. When saints sleep... They're dead. And so whatever it was that they were doing, and we're not going to look at all of the failures there, we're going to look at our own, but it is important for us to realize that an abusive outlook or observance of the Lord's Supper in Paul's day resulted in widespread sickness and death. You say, well, you're, you're trying to scare me. Well, if you're scarable, yes. If someone told me, you know what, 10 people today went to a restaurant and ate the same thing and half of them are dead and the others are in the hospital, my first question would be, what did they eat? And secondly, where did they eat? Why? I'd want to perform a diagnostic. <laughs> I'd want to know. And not only that, I'd want to make sure that I didn't go there to eat tomorrow. Amen. And if there is here a calamity involved with the observance of communion, 
then maybe we would do well to take a look and make sure that, you know what? <laughs> Where did they eat and what did they eat that brought this about? What did they do that brought about this calamity that the apostle brings to their attention when he says, hey, you got this all messed up. And because of that, many are sick and some have passed on. That's a pretty serious mistake. We understand that communion, the Lord's Supper, um, the Eucharist, it's called a thousand different things by a thousand different vantage points. But having said that, you say, well, we're Baptists. I know that, but some of us used to be other things. And if we're not careful, uh, and if we're not students of the Word of God, it is easy for us to bring our misconceptions, perhaps, from other religious viewpoints and never have them changed by the Word of God. It could be possible for someone to be involved even here tonight with a complete misconception about what it is to observe the Lord's Supper. Now, we would almost perhaps, in great numbers, laugh at the thought that someone would think this is how you get saved. But let me be kind. Probably better than half of you at one time believed that. That somehow the bread and the cup were mystically and mysteriously, magically transformed. And when you put these elements into your body, you in essence were accepting Christ. You were taught that uh, this was sacramental. The word sacrament by definition means that which secures salvation. Let me help you tonight. There is nothing sacramental in what we do tonight. There is nothing you will do tonight that can bring you one step closer to heaven. It's not what it's about. And so I felt somewhat compelled today to come back through again and to look at some of those misconceptions or at least mention those misconceptions, but also to look at some things that probably we might not consider so severe, but fail to note. Now, he wasn't saying because you Corinthians believe that the Lord's Supper is a sacrament, God's killing you. It wasn't what he was saying. He wasn't saying because you've picked up some pagan religious belief and adapted it to Christianity, God is getting you. That's not what he's saying. These were sincere Christians. They loved the Lord. They wanted to serve the Lord. As a matter of fact, they probably, in many cases, were at a higher level than some of us because they could take a rebuke. Man, I get scathed every time I read it. And I try to think what it must have been like to have been a member of the Corinthian church when word came that the Apostle Paul has sent us a letter and they all gathered and someone took perhaps the candle and held it and another unrolled the letter and began to read. I've often wondered what happened in that congregation. I'm wondering if maybe some people that really, you know, were anxious to get there by the time we got down to about chapter 2 were wishing they'd stayed home. I'm thinking by the time they got to the end of the first letter to the Corinthians, they might have been looking around going, we ought to shoot that guy, and that guy ought to be a jail, and these people are... I mean, that's really, you think about the scathing accusations that the Apostle Paul makes of good people. Well, their problems, and particularly in observing communion, was not that they thought it a Eucharistic event or a sacrament. They hadn't gone that far. They understood, and when Paul goes through the verses about the Lord Jesus Christ and his involvement in uh, communion, they, they well understood. They were doctrinally stable enough to know the truth. They just had never purged all the junk. And so a lot of people had some mixed up and crazy ideas when it came to the Lord's Supper. 
they, in honesty, just treated it like something to eat and something to drink. Now, can I be honest, having said that, I think sometimes Baptists get to just that place. It's just a cracker and some grape juice. And perhaps we step into the realm of the Corinthians. You see, we think as long as we know that it's not a sacrament, that it doesn't bring salvation, we got this, we got this thing down. But do we really know what it is? Or is it just something to eat and something to drink? And if all it is is just something to eat and something to drink, then aren't we right in lockstep with the Corinthians that were scathed for their failure to understand what communion was all about? He didn't say because you believe this is going to get you to heaven, some of you are going to die and get sick in the sense of almost a curse upon someone who violates the sanctity of communion. He didn't say, because you have pagan concepts. He didn't say, he said, you know what? You just think of this as a big meal, just something without any seriousness to it at all. He talks about some of the frivolity of people. It's almost like a, a great dinner on the grounds and uh, people bringing their food and uh, the children. You can almost visualize the children running wild and hooping and hollering and, and hey, it's a day for the Lord's Supper and... He said, listen, if it's just about eating and drinking, you got this thing all messed up. And so I submit to you tonight that while I don't fear that we are in danger of somehow believing that this is part of our salvation, of overemphasizing some of these things, of making them almost magical, I don't think we're in danger of doing it. I think there's enough Bible believers here tonight. I don't think that would be our sin. But I honestly believe we could easily step over a line where, well, yeah, let's just get this over with and do something else. That it has no meaning. That it has no bearing. This is a remembrance of what we know of specifically as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. That's why we call it the Lord's Supper. It is not. It is a remembrance of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was found uh, very, or was, is found in the Scripture in the context of the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. It is the time when the Lord gathers for the last time in a specific sense with His disciples it is the observance of the Passover that brings them together. And so there are similarities between the Lord's Supper and the Passover that they would have understood. You remember when the disciples came and they had that meal with the Lord, it was in observance of Passover. They had come to him and said, Lord, whence shall we prepare the Passover? Where do you want to eat the Passover? These individuals, these disciples of the Lord, they were careful observers of the Jewish rule that God had given them of observing the Passover. And so the Lord had instructed them, you go, you find this place, you tell the gentleman that we want the upstairs room, and, that, and he said, we're going to eat the Passover there. He didn't say we're going to junk all this other, we're going to eat the Passover there. And in Jewish fashion, the Lord with his disciples went to an upper room and ate a meal, I'm convinced, very much like a Jewish family in Jerusalem or Judea at that time would probably have observed very closely in timing. Not everything that the Jewish tradition observes today with Passover is scriptural. Over the passage of time, there is always a deterioration. And so things have crept in from over the years. And now in the observance of Passover, someone told me there are some things that they do in remembrance of the Holocaust. Well, certainly the Lord and His disciples didn't think anything about the Holocaust when they observed the Lord's Supper. But things have crept in and things that are, have no bearing whatsoever have become uh, sim similar to all the other things and combined so that, you understand what I'm saying, that just loses its truthfulness along the way. 
And that's what the Lord was, or what Paul was warning the Corinthians about here is, listen, you've got this mixed up with too much junk. And what was to be good for you has now become dangerous because you've gotten it all out of kilter here. But this event, as I said, comes from the time that the Lord met with the disciples in the upper room. That account is found in several places in the Gospels. It's found in Matthew 26. It's found in Mark chapter 14, and it's found in Luke chapter 22. The accounts are very similar. Some of the Gospels provide some additional details that others do not. And I say, as I've said for most of my ministry, the four Gospels provide us with almost that surround sound feeling in the sense that we don't just get it from here. We see this perspective and this perspective and this perspective and this perspective. And in so doing, we get the complete picture. Luke describes what he sees from here. And Mark describes what he sees from here. And John describes what he sees from here. And sometimes they don't match specifically because they're seeing from different perspectives. And in all combination, they provide us with a total picture. It is John that does not give us an account of the Last Supper per se. But it is John that provides us with an element, I think, that is probably as important as the fruit of the vine and the bread. And so I'm going to kind of end up there in a few minutes and show you some things that communion should be about. Communion, first of all, for Christ and his disciples was a time of remembrance. It was the Passover. If you remember the Passover and the teachings of the Passover from the Old Testament, you will know that God instituted the Passover after that the children of Israel had left Egypt after the first Passover. But at that time it was not established as a ritual to be observed. Later on, God lays down the parameters. He said they were going to do it, but later on he lays down the parameters and he says, here's when you'll do this and you'll observe this on a yearly basis and you'll do it to remember what happened here. And so for so many years and there were times, you understand if you read your Bible, there were times and sometimes long as a century or better where there was no observance of the Passover. The Jews became so carnal and moved so far away from God that for better than a century in some cases, they never observed a Passover. Though God had said every year, you need to remember this. It's vital for you to keep this in mind. To remember. To remember what? Remember when God delivered you from Egypt and brought you out. You were bond servants and slaves in Egypt. And God delivered you miraculously. And that observance of the Passover was to remind them that it wasn't just something that they did for themselves. Do you ever notice how prone we are after a great deliverance to begin to pat ourselves on the back? And as time goes on, we become more and more the champion of the hour. This is what I did. <laughs> and in reality... We'd have crashed and burned if it hadn't been for the Lord. But somehow over time, I think the Lord knew that human nature would pull the focus off of himself and put it on something else, maybe the mystical things that seemed to happen. They probably would never forget Moses' rod that became a snake. But they would probably forget that we'd still been in Egypt if it hadn't been for God. Uh, they was struggled when they moved out into the wilderness and they uh, got angry on occasion and they turned just about the time they got out into the wilderness. They began to pull away from God. They were a mean-spirited people in every sense of the word. And so God instituted the Passover to remind them. Once a year there was careful ritual set down and established that would take them back. And I believe with all my heart, much of it was probably identical to what had happened in an average Jewish home the night that the death angel was to pass over. 
I think they ate the same thing. I think they ate in the same manner. They ate with the same thoughts in mind. I, I know that they actually dressed in their traveling clothes long after because they were to remember that they were to eat this Passover and God was going to judge the Egyptians and then they were going to leave. They had their bags packed. And that became part of that Passover observance. That's what Christ and the disciples were looking at. They were remembering a time when God delivered them through the death of an animal, which was a lamb. But there was more than just the looking back because they observed the Lord's Supper with the Lamb of God that was to be offered for sins. So while it was very much the same, while we can find great insight by looking to the Passover and how the Passover was to be observed, it was in the same time frame. They knew they made haste because they knew what the parameters for the Passover were all about. Even though there were numerous similarities, there were also some differences and some things that they were doing that they probably would not recognize until after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples knew less doctrine. I'm going to say this, probably go out on a limb, but I'm pretty sure I could prove it. They knew less doctrinal truth about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ than any one of you does today. They didn't get it. It's mentioned at least five times. Where the Lord told them specifically, here's what's going on. I'm going to go to the cross. And they got angry. They got upset. They said, not so. That'll never happen. That can't be. We'll die. They didn't get it. But after his death, burial, and resurrection, they began to pick up those pieces of information that they had not gathered before. And like those on the road to Emmaus, their hearts began to burn because now they could put the pieces together. And it made sense. So these disciples, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, have the ability then to put some things together. And as far as we know, by the time the gospel had spread through Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and it had now reached all the way to the uttermost part of the world, that's where the Corinthian church was. They were observing the Lord's Supper, which was an observance of Passover. But something had gone tragically wrong <laughs> because for them it had just become an occasion to get together and eat some bread, drink some grape juice and go on your way. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, for this cause many are sickly and some are dead, sleeping. You need to get this thing right. You need to make sure that you're doing this thing for the right reason and in the right manner and method. Let me say very quickly there are two elements involved in the Lord's Supper. Now, understand, they had had a meal. They ate a meal at Passover. They had had a meal. After the supper was ended, he takes the cup and he takes the bread and he shows them more. But he uses the cup and he uses the loaf of bread. And he explains to them what the meaning is. Now let me just say in passing, and I'm not going to spend a long time on it because we've taught and taught and taught and taught and taught on it. The bread is simply unleavened bread. Unseasoned. Pretty bland. There was nothing fancy. There was no dietary longing for this bread. This was not the thing you said at home at night watching a football game and said, hey, we got to get 11 bread in the house. This was a staple necessary to just live. This was very often what the shepherds would take into the fields or what those who were traveling would take simply because it did not spoil as quickly. And as a result, this was the most common bread that there was. 
If you were going to go on a long journey and you had loaded the animals and you were about to travel many, many miles, you probably would have put some unleavened bread somewhere in a bag, in a sack that you would take with you. It would not be the thing your kids would go, goody, 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 we got unleavened bread. It would probably be, do we have to eat that? But the Lord used that and chose that because the scripture indicated that when we beheld him, there was nothing comely in him, nothing to cause us to desire him. We had seen Christ in the day that he walked the earth. It was not like we would have said, boy, there right there is a man that's successful. I can tell by looking at him. The Bible said there was nothing to draw us to him at all. He was just an ordinary person. Probably the kind of individual you could pass a hundred times and never remember you'd passed him. There's nothing that drew us to him. He was not into the physical appearance. And he did not appear as a king or as a potentate or as a ruler or as a judge. He just was a common, everyday, ordinary person. You probably saw 50 of them today and you don't even remember who or what they looked like. It's just plain bread. You see, if it had been a unique blend, if it had been something with a unique flavor, can I tell you what people would have worshipped? They'd have been worshipping the flavor or the blend. We are such a sinful people. We are so easily drawn off track. Case in point are the millions and millions of holy things that the church has collected. I mentioned on numerous occasions in jest, but there's no jest to it. If I remember correctly, there are five of the nails that were used to crucify Christ in the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria. I look, some of you are confused, rightfully so. They only use three. But five of them are in the Hofburg Palace, the museum there. The tablecloth from the Lord's Supper is there. I've seen it. I've seen it. Great stories are made of the pursuit of the Holy Grail, which is the cup. We are so drawn to where we, we listen to Brother Matt talk about the anim, animism of, of the people down in Trinidad. They worship the spirits and they worship objects, but we are no different. If it weren't for the saving grace of God and a Bible that says that's stupid, don't do it, we'd have shrines built everywhere. We'd be bound down and we're just like every pagan source of humanity around the world. We're not any different than that. You realize if America is not steeped in that, it's because of a book. Just plain bread. It's not even as good as a cracker. I've had people ask me, say, well, what does it taste like? I've never done this before. I said, well, it's kind of like a cracker with no salt. You know, salt is pretty much the redeeming quality of a cracker. Why unleavened bread? Because the Lord had talked and commented about leaven. Leaven was used very commonly in Israel. Leaven was a means of, it was a preservative. It was a preservative that caused things to last longer, not to decay. It was that preservative that they had used very often. It was yeast. And the Lord spoke against it. When he used the bread, he said, we use the unleavened bread. And when he talked about leaven, he used it and compared it to the doctrine of the Pharisees. He got into a bit of a discussion with the disciples on occasion. And uh, in Matthew 16, he told them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And, and they, being the theologians and Bible students that they were, missed it completely. It went right over the top of their head. And they said, oh, it's because we didn't bring any bread to eat. He's upset. He's, he's, you know. And they just were all messed up. And finally the Lord set them down and had to tell them. Okay, guys, everybody forget what you're thinking and listen. I'm talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. Meaning this, that false doctrine is much like leaven in that you put in a little bit. 
and it goes to work. And over time, it will leaven the entire thing. You put a little leaven in the bread. The common thing was to take the leaven and to put it in the bread and then fold the bread again and again over the top and then put it aside and cover it and just let it sit there by itself. And that leaven would in short time permeate every bit of that loaf. And you know what the Lord said? He said, that's like the doctrine of the Pharisees. Be careful of the doctrine of the Pharisees. A little leaven... <laughs> leaveneth the whole lump. So when we observe the Lord's Supper, we use, and uh, you say, well, does it really matter? I, well, it matters to me. We find an unleavened piece of bread, which in honesty tastes somewhat like a stale cracker. You say, ooh, I don't want that. You see, but you missed it. If you had to have something that tasted good and sweet, you'd have rejected Christ. Because there was nothing to draw us to Christ in his human form. Just plain and order. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were the elitists. They wore the fancy clothing. They were the ones that when they walked, they made sure there were bells that tinkled as they walked so people would be sure to know they were coming. Christ was never there. He was that unseen presence very often. He said, you use unleavened bread. When they used the cup, there was nothing fermented in that cup. And again, I understand. Some of you came from religious backgrounds, and well, that's the way we did it. And well, welcome to the Baptists. We never did it that way. Well, why not? Because we had one source of authority, and it's always been this book. We've never had a pope We've never had a prelate. We've never had a synod. We've never had a council. We've never had, we don't even let the preacher dictate to us what we believe as a Baptist. What saith the Lord? That's what we want to know. What does the book say? That's what distinguishes us from virtually every religious belief in the United States. Oh, they say we believe the Bible. Well, but i probably name eight or ten things you'd say. Well, you know, that's, that's just the way we've always done it. If you, believe, if you believe taking the Lord's Supper gets you to heaven, you miss the book. The wine was, by scriptural definition, called new wine. Fruit of the vine. Now, I know what the wino thinks of today. When he talks about the fruit of the vine, he can't even say it. It's become a common term, but think about it. The fruit of the vine. Why would they call it the fruit of the vine if it's something you pulled off the grapevine 15 years ago? It's, been a, it's not fruit anymore. You say, well, you know, that term applies good. I'm glad you said that because in a couple months I'm going to bring you some Tomatoes. And I'm going to watch you eat them because they're fruit of the vine. They've just been laying out in the field for several months and they're kind of unsightly and grisly and they have a funny taste and smell to them. But you won't have any problem, I'm sure, because you know that fruit of the vine is something that could be 20 years old. You see, we deny our own conscience. Fruit of the vine, by definition, is that's what's pulled from the vine. I don't expect you to believe that just because it makes sense, but I would expect you to believe it because the Scripture indicates that. Amen. Isaiah 65, verse number 8 says, As new wine is found in the cluster. Still want to argue? You can't use a Bible to prove that. That's become one of the big issues today. The sweeping idea brought to us by the New Age religions through the contemporary Christian movement and now the emergent church has become the thought that how dare a preacher tell you you're not supposed to drink wine. I mean, after all, you know, it's the friendly thing to do. People all around the world drink wine. You ever see all, you know, I used to use those same excuses about my friends when I was growing up. So my mom would let me go to places I wanted to go to and she never would. 
My mom had this silly notion that, you know, if all my friends were doing something that she didn't agree with, it didn't matter. And when I began to argue my case, she always said this, if all your friends jump off the cliff, what are you going to do? Well, I know some other Christians, and they, you know some other Christians that have rejected the clear teaching of the Scripture. They may be nice. They may love the Lord. They may sing sweet songs about Jesus, but scripturally, they're off base. And if you want to adhere to that, you are off base. New wine is found in the cluster. Christ, in each case you looked at there, says, I'm drinking new wine. And he says, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to drink it anymore till I drink it new with you in the kingdom. That's not again. He's not saying, I won't drink anymore till I drink it again. He said, I'm not going to drink it. I drink it new. That's what he drinks. The Nazarite, which was a step above the other ordinary Israelites in their walk with God, the Nazarite was a higher level of holiness than the average Jew. And they were forbidden even to touch something that came from the grapevine for fear of that fermentation and that experience that would come that would draw them away from the Lord. The example for that is given to us in the book of Genesis. When Joseph is in jail and Pharaoh's butler and uh, his uh, baker, cook, whatever the guy was. I can't remember now. Was he a butler or a baker? You sure of that? I got you confused now. All right. They have a dream. They say, you know, we had this dream. And uh, one of them tells his dream to Joseph. And Joseph interprets the dream. And the dream was this. He said, I had Pharaoh's cup in my hand. And he said, I pressed the grapes into the cup. He's got the cluster. And he pressed the grapes in. That's what Pharaoh was drinking. When Jesus turned the water into wine, do you understand if he turned it into fermented alcohol, Jesus Christ is not what you think? <laughs> He's not going to keep you out of hell because that's where he is himself. Oh, you say, I'm just telling you what the biblical truth is. You put alcohol to your neighbor's lip, causing him to be drunk, and you bear the wrath of an almighty God, according to the book of Habakkuk. You say, well, you know, they said, you know, at first they always, you know, they, they bring the good stuff, and then, when the, then they bring the, he said, but you've saved the best for last. Do you know why people said the best was the first? Because that's the new wine. After they ran out of new wine, they went back and began to get stuff that had been back there for a while, and there's nothing you can do to keep it from fermenting. So Jewish custom was you go get a little, you mix it with water, and you, you, know, you try to put a little sugar in it or something, and, but it's not good. And you know what they said? They said, man, you save the best stuff for last, the fruit of the vine. That's what Christ turned the water into. So the elements are unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. You got that. Let's move on. What's the purpose of communion? Number one, it is remembering the sacrifice that bought our salvation. Uh, you know, we're real good at saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me, but never spending much time and deliberating on exactly what he did when he saved you. Somehow we think that because he has saved us, we don't have to think about that anymore because we're perfect. If we were honest and just considered the truth of the matter, it is more miraculous to me today that God saved me than the day he saved me. During my time away, I visited the church and they asked me to just give my testimony and then uh, it was kind of an unusual thing to stand in a pulpit and say, you know, in 1960, I sat right over here on this front row as a little five-year-old boy, and Joe Henry Hankins preached, and God dealt with my heart, and I got saved that night when I got home. My mother led me to Christ right over there where I sat when I heard the gospel, and there it was, the same pews there. There's nothing magical or mystical about that pew. And I remember, and I never will forget, 
I don't believe we're saved by feeling. I don't believe you use a feeling to determine whether you're saved or not. But I do know this. When God moves in, you know something's different. And I'll never forget that feeling that a five-year-old boy had when he realized God had saved him and forgiven him. But you know what? That little five-year-old boy was an angel compared to this old guy that stands up and preaches to you every week. And I stand even more amazed today that God saved me. <laughs> Anybody would save a five-year-old kid. But would they save a five-year-old kid knowing that they would grow up and do the things that a... <gasps> you say, what have you done? Probably nothing you haven't done. But you know something about reading this book and preaching about sin that makes you conscious of your own sin. Things that other people in this world probably never even think about bother me. I'm amazed that he say, you know when you observe the Lord's Supper, you're remembering a broken body and blood poured out to redeem you from the curse. You realize if Christ died to make us better people, he was a failure. You say, well, I'm better than I was. Yeah, but you're still not good enough to be my neighbor. <laughs> if, he, if his whole coming was to somehow make us a better people, what a failure. You know what he came to do? He came to blank it out. He just blanked everything out, every sin, every wretchedness, everything that I am, just blanked it out. And in its place, he wrote righteousness. Every document in heaven that has my name attached to it has a postscript right next to it that says righteous, sinless. You say, well, that's not true. I know, but in heaven, nobody corrects the Lord. I'm covered. That fruit of the vine represents that blood that was shed. Pure. Pure. Poured out for us. Now then, let me give you this and I'm going to finish because I think this is an element in John. John doesn't mention the bread. Doesn't mention the fruit of the vine. He doesn't even talk about the cup. And, but it does tell us in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You understand that the context here is very close to what we know of as the Last Supper. It doesn't mention him taking the bread and taking the cup. But I'll tell you what it does mention. Verse 4, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. You know the last thing Jesus did in communion with his disciples was to humble himself probably in one of the greatest ways he ever humbled himself. He wrapped a towel around his waist and he took a basin of water and he went around and washed the dirty, stinking feet of his disciples. Now, I'm not telling you somehow that that's what makes this, but it is part of this communion, this Last Supper. I think that Corinthians is clear. We need to recognize and remember the death, burial, and resurrection for us. You ought to go back and rehearse the day you got saved. You ought to go back and think about when Jesus washed your sins away and made you white as snow. You ought to think about all the things that have happened in your life since then that you'll never have to give an account of because Calvary covers it all. Every thought, you ought to realize what a great debt you owe to the Lamb of God. But understand this, he went from disciple to disciple and washed their feet an offensive thing so much so that Peter said, you're not washing my feet. 
And Jesus said, no, wait a minute, this is a picture, remember? Communion's a picture. Jesus said, no, no, no. He said, it's not about washing the feet, Peter. It's a picture. He said, you see, if I don't wash you, then it's because you don't have any part with me. And then Peter, you know, he swings from one side to the other and he says, oh, man, throw the bucket of water in my face then. Top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And the Lord said, no, no, you're missing the whole picture, Peter. He said, you see, he that's clean doesn't need to be washed completely. But your feet get dirty. And so occasionally you need to have your feet cleaned. And when he was all said and done, he said, you know what? He said, I, your Lord and Master, have done this for you. And he said, you know what? You want to be good disciples? You need to learn to do that for each other. Now, I'm not talking about, again, getting a bucket and washing somebody's feet. I'm talking about that type of care and compassion that would humble itself for the most unworthy among us and say, this is my brother. This is my sister. And I'm going to care for them because they are my brother and my sister. I think that's a part of this understanding of communion. We say, well, I want to remember his body and uh, his blood that was shed for me, and I agree. But you know, he shed his blood and gave his body to make us into those that he calls saints and disciples. But he says if you want to be disciples, there's some things you need to do, like caring for each other. And I believe that an element of the Lord's Supper is recognizing my tie to other believers in Christ. Not only the fact that he saved me by shedding his blood and giving his body, but that he linked me to you in a way that nothing in this world would ever link us. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that we have communion with each other. And that communion needs to be a sacrificial communion. I just say this. I think you ought to rehearse what Christ did when he saved you in these moments. You ought to take time to find that place in your heart where thankfulness resides. You ought to be able to say, thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you for dying on that cross so I don't ever have to worry about paying for my horrible, horrible sins. I'm free because you set me free. But I think maybe a little more too in that sense. We ought to recognize I'm among God's people who have the same testimony that I have. And I need to care for them. And maybe you just need to rehearse down in your heart, maybe somebody you're upset with, angry with, mad with, and let it go. Well, you don't know what they did. Listen, Christ put a towel around his waist and took a basin of water and washed the feet of fishermen. Who are you and I to somehow feel justified and vindicated in our own hatred of a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ? You say, well, are you absolutely sure? No, I'm really not. I don't know. But I know something the Corinthians were doing, they were doing wrong. And as a result of what they were doing wrong, folks were getting sick. And some of them had been buried. Because they missed the point. And I understand we independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, separated, sanctified Baptists, we get the point. You can't get saved by taking communion. But is it possible we could miss the point like the Corinthians did and find out it really doesn't mean anything at all? It's just something we do every once in a while. I've had people over the years ask me, how often do you have communion? And I've told them, I don't have a set time. And some of you have come from other churches. Some of you come from churches where they did it every week. I don't have a problem with that. 
Why don't you do it that way? Because I don't want it ever to lose its meaning to me. I fear that it would lose what meaning it's supposed to have, that somehow it would become just a ritual, just something that we do, something that we can, let's do this and get it over with and get out of here. And I would lose touch with what God established to be as special to me as the Passover was to a redeemed Israel. I want to be like that firstborn in Israel three years into the wilderness when they took that lamb and he still had those memories, those pictures in his mind of that lamb and its body convulsing as the last of the blood poured. And the father said, here, take this bunch of hyssop and put the blood quickly on the door. And as he did that, he said, why are we doing this, Papa? And he said, to keep you alive. I want to feel like he felt as he sat in that home and began to hear the wail down the street from some of the Egyptian boys that he'd gone to high school with as their mamas and daddies began to scream and cry because they found the dead bodies of their firstborn. I want to know what that firstborn felt when he took and commemorated Passover. You understand it was desperately personal. I want it to mean that to me every time. I want to see from his hands and his head and his feet that sorrow and love that flowed mingled for me. I want it to be right. So we do it as often as the Lord stirs hearts. There are just times when I look out over a congregation and I think down in the depths of my soul, we need to just go back to the cross and remember our Savior. And so there are times when I feel like the Lord beckons us. Not something on a calendar or on a clock. Something in a heart that says I'm off base here and I need to be pulled back again to remember. So I hope tonight you understand perhaps a little more about Passover and what took place at the Lord's Supper and maybe even something that took place in that context that we don't even think about. Like the Lord humbling himself to prove his love for his disciples. And he did say to them, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought to treat each other with some care and respect and love. So I ask you tonight, is there something between you and the Lord Something that you'd be ashamed of if he walked into your presence right now. Something, maybe the first words out of your mouth would be, Lord, I didn't expect to see you here. God, would you please forgive? Then let's get that forgiven now. But is there something that's harbored in your heart that you'd wish wasn't there if the Lord came right now tonight? and You realize, you know, I should have let that go many, many years ago. But I thought I'd always settle it. But you know what I realized? Some things don't ever get settled. And here I am standing before a holy God with something vile and wicked that shouldn't even be in my heart. And I can't settle it now, so I'll have to answer for it. Get rid of it now. Purge it. Cleanse it. Could I invite you in these next few minutes just to spend some time right there in your seat? I'm going to ask you to come forward. You don't have to pray out loud. But would you not spend the next few minutes right there in the presence of a Savior and ask Him to make you worthy, to help you to remember and to recognize what we are doing here, that it might mean to us what it was supposed to and intended to mean, that it might have that effect in our hearts and lives that He intended. I realize we can't be transported through time back to the cross, but I realized the Spirit of God that lives within me was there. He knew firsthand everything that took place and that somehow He might just remind me tonight that my Savior gave all for me. And then I would that you'd ask the Lord to show you if there's something perhaps in a heart that you should have humbled yourself over a long time ago and let it go. Maybe there's another brother or sister and in a practical sense you should have been caring for them and you haven't been. 
Maybe it's time to just let it go and say, God, make me what my Savior was in those last few moments. In those last few hours. When he was so burdened, he couldn't even contain himself in the garden. The drops of blood poured as he prayed. But even under that great duress and pressure, he took time to show the disciples something that would help them never to question his love for them. Isn't it fair that our brothers and sisters in Christ should know that that's what being a part of Hope Baptist is all about? That's what being a Christian is all about. You don't have to earn my love. You don't have to be worthy. I just love you because you're my brother or sister in Christ. And when you do something wrong, guess what? I've done a lot of things wrong myself. We're family. Let it go. I'm going to give you a few minutes to just spend some time in prayer. And then we're going to observe communion. Have these gentlemen join me and I would ask that as we pass these things that all would wait until everyone has received, whether it be the little cup or uh, the, the bread and wait until everyone and once everyone has the cup or the bread, we'll pray and then we'll partake together. would also maybe say to the parents that Kind of keep an eye on the children. These things can be dropped or whatever. Be cautious there. Help them. And I would also warn you as a parent that if your child's not saved, this is not what they should be doing. This is for disciples. You say, well, I want my kid to get used to it. Well, again, just remember, for this cause, many are sickly and some sleep. God's pretty particular about things being done the right way. And I'm not saying don't explain it to a child, but explain it to a child that this is what saved people do. And someday when you've trusted Christ and you're saved, you're welcome to be part of this. But it's only for those who are saved. So use it as a teaching tool, perhaps. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where I had you turn a moment ago, in verse number 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
Let's pray. Our Father, we have here just a small piece of unleavened bread, but Lord, we understand that it is, Lord, what it brings to mind as we think about the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, the suffering and, Lord, the horrific treatment that you endured on our behalf. Lord, I'm thankful that it is through the offering of one sacrifice that no other sacrifice becomes necessary. It is through the offering of a perfect sacrifice that whosoever will can be made perfect. Lord, tonight uh, there's the appearance that these are all pretty good people, moral and doing their best. But Father, that's because you saved some of us from what we were, changed our life. The old things passed away. But Lord, there's some here that were saved not just from what they were, but God, they were saved from what they would have become. Lord, I know Paul was the chiefest of sinners. But Lord, I wonder how bad some of us could have become had it not been for the intervention of the grace of God that stopped us in our sinful tracks and gave us a new name and a new heart, cleansed us from our old sins, but changed our future as well. I'm thankful tonight that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ not only saved us from our sins, but it kept us from becoming what we would most certainly have become. And that simply is just far, far worse than we were when grace reached us. Thank you for the body of Christ that was broken on our behalf. May we never take lightly what price you paid for our sins. The Bible said they ate. You may eat. First Corinthians chapter 11 says, After the same manner also... He took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come.
Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, it is the fruit of the vine that pictures the blood that was shed. Lord, people can leave this life without the shedding of blood. It is the shedding of blood that brings horror to our hearts as we cannot help but associate the shedding of blood with suffering. And Lord, this reminds us of the intensity of the pain and the anguish and the suffering that was part of our redemption. Lord, forgive us. We know you as God and in our minds we can explain that God certainly could have endured the pain and it wasn't a big deal. But Lord, we also know what it is to be human. And we know that our Savior was God in the flesh. And we know that He suffered more than any human being has ever suffered on planet earth for our sins. Lord, it is ironic that this fruit of the vine is sweet, pleasant, Lord, we recognize that because of what you paid for our sinfulness, our lives can be pleasant and sweet because we stand redeemed. Lord, in Christ this evening, we have not just the hope of heaven, but the confidence, the knowledge that one day when this life is finished, the blood of our Savior has opened the door. And for all of eternity, we'll have time to thank you and to remember what an unspeakable gift God has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for every drop of blood that was shed. Thank you for loving us more than we ever could have loved ourselves. And thank you tonight that heaven has nothing to do with us. Our goodness, our badness, our worthiness, our unworthiness. Thank you, Lord, that there's only one thing that can wash away our sins. Nothing else. It's just the blood of Jesus. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. You may drink. There before you in your seat is a little place where you can put those cups if you'd like and they'll come around and collect them in a few minutes. I hope tonight in this little bit of time we spent that it wasn't just an observation or a ritual but somehow the Spirit of God touched your heart and as you leave tonight you're mindful of the fact that there was a price that was paid for you to be set free and Jesus paid it all. Boy, it would be wonderful if we could keep that in our minds every day. But we forget. And so I hope tonight, maybe in this few moments of observation, you'll grasp something that you can hang on to for the next day and week and month and remember how good it is to be redeemed. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of being a part of Lord, something perhaps the world would seem to think unusual. And Lord, we recognize that it is just merely a picture. But Lord, we thank you for what prompted the picture. We thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. I'm thankful, Lord, that we don't have a God like the other gods of this world. Lord, I know you said there were gods many and Lords many and certainly all kinds of spiritual entities. But I'm thankful tonight that our God is the God of all gods. That our Savior is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And I'm thankful, Lord, when I close my eyes that I can talk to my Father who literally owns it all and made it all and loves me. Thank you for our salvation. We pray that you'd help us to be worthy of what you've done for us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.